Hi, Liam. Can you yeah, hear me? Thanks. thanks for joining us. Hello, guys. Thanks for joining us for the Snooper Profiles. Uh, tonight we've got Liam Highfield. Uh, Liam is a snooker professional, as most of you know. And, you know, over the last few weeks, guys, we've had different guests on. We've had some some of the other uh, snooker professionals who have been on the tour for 20, 30 years, talking about their backgrounds, talking about um, how they got on the tour and how they're doing on the tour. It's always quite refreshing to have a younger player uh, who's been on the tour. Uh, Liam, to that extent, is a player, as a snooker professional who's been on the tour for 10 years. Uh, Liam's currently ranked, uh, provisionally ranked, actually. Correct me if I'm wrong now, Liam. You're provisionally ranked, I think you're provisionally ranked 46. And your highest uh, provisional ranking prior to that was around a sort of 50 mark. Yeah. And as I said, you've been, you've been on the tour for 10 years, thereabouts. So, and at the age of 30, I suppose you could say you came in quite young yeah, in that regard, and you extended yourself from the uh, Pontins, I think it's the Pontins events, that got you on in the first place. So again, thanks very much for coming on, mate, talk a little bit about yourself. So uh, when did it all start, Liam? Give us a little bit of background stuff on your, your early days. How did you get introduced to Snooker from the junior and how that extended itself to a good level and then the tour? Uh, just kind of picked up a cue after watching. I think it won the world title in 98 and I was uh, about eight years old. Um, and just kind of one of them stories, you know, you're just obsessed with it as a kid. Uh, just played with all the juniors. I was lucky enough to have a pretty pretty strong junior days with, uh, you know, the likes of Jack Lazowski, Karen Wilson, Stuart Carrington, um, other players like like Michael Wosley, uh, Adam Duffy. They were they were all really good players. And then just we we were all all, all sort of went into the, like what you were on about there, the Pontins International Open Series, uh, and and I used to turn pro when I was about nineteen. Um, yeah, me, me and Jack were, were sort of number one and two when we qualified to be a pro. Uh, mm. Obviously, that was about that was about 10, 11 years ago now. Does it seem like, uh, does it, did it feel like, I mean, look, obviously you, you got on a tour at the age of 19. Mm. And sort of going back to that at, at that stage, did, did you feel you were at the right age, you were ready for the tour? Yeah, um, I think because the, the group of us was sort of so strong as junior, I, I don't the the amateur scene of, of sort of people in the in their early twenties were that that good, even though they were old, older than us. Um, so I think yeah, we kind of just jumped straight from junior to the pro, but but then because the standard of the tour sort of found it found it quite all of us found it quite early. Let's talk about let's talk about those first couple of years on the tour. Obviously, you're up against the big names and what have you at the format at the time. Was the was it what you expected it to be, or was it a kind of a shock? Or how did you how did you feel getting on there? I mean, in terms of the 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 level, the standard of snooker. It was a, it was a strange one for me because early on in my career. I, wins over like sort of top players um, but would then kind of lose the next match or, or you know or, or would lose some qualified low rank players I, fa I always found the middle rank players I thought they they kind of outwitted rather than last table but if you played a top player and they didn't play well it was kind of the balls were right in front of you all ready to clear up because they were playing it so tightly. So I, maybe I was lucky that they, they never played quite so well against me. Mm. Got a few wins over, you know, like so like Bingham, Williams, Selby, early on in my career. Mm -hmm. But as the years have gone by, sort of, I'd become probably the one to be a bit tougher to beat for people below me. But I kind of think it's been hard for me lately to cut players. That's mm -hmm. been the struggle. 
And I mean, look, these days, I mean, obviously, guys, even even of your ranking, you know what you have to do. You know have to you know you have to win those qualifiers, those first round matches, to sort of even maintain your position on the tour. But going back, you know, obviously back in 2010, 2011, when you were playing those matches, you're obviously winning quite a lot of those uh, qualifiers and those first round matches to keep yourself on the tour. Yeah, I always, yeah, early, so I've been able to, to win my first one or two matches. And the, the struggle for me has always been going to the um, I'm, it, It's crazy to think that I was top 64 in my first or second season. I think I 63 quite like in a 64 quite quick um mm. but yeah is has always been to to get runs in tournaments seems to have been the, the the struggle for me like over the years but always been quite consistent you know obviously staying on the tour for as long as i have um but it's just you just got to find something to get to the next level to get to, you know quarters and semis in, in competitions to get higher, otherwise you get stuck where I am, um, sort of between like forty and sixty. Uh, so just, just got to try new things, I think. And what's, what sort of things were going through your mind at the time, Leon, in those first couple of years when you got on the tour? I mean, did you did it, did it take you away to get used to traveling to the venues? Were you nervous? Did, did you was there a lot of things that you needed to think about to change your game, to up your game? What sort of things were going through your mind? Uh, no. To be honest, I just I took it all in my stride early on. But I never liked travelling in my younger days, which I don't think was a help at all. I sort of couldn't couldn't wait to get home from. There was, there was an awful lot of like uh, events called uh, see and I think six of them were in Europe with very little money. So financially, uh, that wasn't good for anybody. Outside. You know, top thirty-two at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were kind of a nightmare, I think, for for eighty percent at all. Uh, so yeah, it was it was like a good time to turn pro because there was a lot of comps. But mm-hmm. I, I think I turned pro at the time that Barry Hearn came in, the very first season that he took over. So it was like all was kind of increasing in tournaments, but not increasing money at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it, I sort of. I think it may have been better to turn pro a few years later. Were you were you were you a very confident player then when you got on a tour? Liam? were you were you like a very confident player, or were you nervous, or did you did you feel as if you improved very quickly even in the first two seasons? Uh, not really. Good wins, but I always practiced really hard. I didn't, but I don't feel like I was much better at. Um, at 23, as I was at 17, I don't think them years I really improved mm-hmm. that. I think I'm a much better player now, but uh, sort of early on getting on the tour, I don't think I improved quickly then. Mm-hmm. But it's mad to think that I'm not getting two dissimilar results now to when I was here as good as I was then. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the frustrating part that you you know you feel so much better you're not getting too much out of it. I mean, uh, who were you, I mean, who were you practicing with at the time in those early, those first couple of seasons? Who were you practicing with, and who was coaching you? Who was looking after you? Who were you looking up to? Uh, back then, I was. I think I I was on I was on my own. Like, coach or anything. Uh, but I used to play with maybe in the top thirty-two and being coached top sixty-nine. They were both really local, so you could go and play them. Ricky Walton was another one to go up and practice quite a bit because we were under the at the time. Uh, yeah, so it was a good, good practice. But it was just um, just the matches, I think, that that's mm-hmm. what I was with. You know, just being in there and sort of staying I didn't, I didn't have the best of temperaments when I was younger. Um, it's, much, it's much better now, but it still needs to get better. Uh, mm-hmm. but, I mean... Yeah, in, in about a week's time, we're going to have a we're going to have a live chat uh, in our sort of group discussions. We're going to be talking about uh, the players who are looking to get on the tour, on the professional tour, the kind of things that they're thinking about and the way they prepare themselves 
what would you say are the difference differences uh, then when you you know when you first got on the tour to now? Do you think players the, the players need to prepare themselves differently and think differently and think ahead? What sort of thing? yeah, I think yeah. snooker players are behind with uh, science, if you like. Um, I don't know whether it's because they're a bit more physical. The golf's not really that much more physical, but I think uh, you know, I think I think we just think practice is the most it's going to be the best. But I don't think that I don't think that's anywhere near the case. Thing you have got to practice, but I think it's about the other thing you do um, to be successful. And it's something that I've. Uh, Maybe when I was 25 and at a 24, I had a little period with Terry Griffiths, and he kind of yeah. pulled my into a lower amount, but with more sort of mental stuff involved. And I think that was a kind of case of doing like rather than like quantity. I think that's the approach. If I was turning pro now, that I would take. So for them players who are trying to do that, I think that's something they need to look at. And do you think if players? I mean, did, I mean, on, on just touching on those early days with you, did, did you did you find there was times maybe you were getting a little bit ahead of yourself, you know, and anticipating? Uh, yeah, well, the kind of art of snooker and, and the mindset of snooker is to stay really present. Um, yeah, not to get ahead of yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know whether my early days I did. I think more now I get a bit more. I get excited now when kind of... I get on a little run because I think I think you appreciate them a bit more as you get older um, than you do when you're young. It's kind of you've got a big expectation when you're younger. Um, you know, when you're like 20, you think you're going to take the world apart. And unfortunately, when it doesn't work out, you kind of mm-hmm. step and start appreciating the little things you do a bit more. And I think, you know, you just touched on it earlier and that, that it's, it's one of those sports and one of those games where the mental side is so important. Because you're thinking about, I mean, this is what we're going to go on right now. We're going to go on to everything else, like, you know, settling in preparation, doubts, concerns about your game and, and what you need to do to improve. And you could perhaps say that that's where you are now. You know, you you came in very young. You're, you're still only 30. You know, a lot of people will say you're still, you know, I mean, very, very young. And, you know, we, we, we spoke, you know, we spoke to Martin Gould and Tom Ford over the last few weeks. They've been on the tour 10, year, 10 years longer than you, and they sort of started performing a bit a bit later, you know, yeah. in their years. And, and do you think that that is the sort of format in, in terms of yourself? I think it is now, because I think with the standard of the tour being so high, I think the edge is mental and not sort of physical, if you like. I think everybody can play to a great level. So I think it's, it takes that maturity from... You know, there's a big difference between being a 30-year-old and a 20-year-old. So I think it just takes a bit of maturity to be, you know, like, to know men do to win. Um, whereas I think, I think, I think like, you know, in the mid-90s or something, maybe when the standard wasn't quite as high, if you was putting work in, you would get loads of results. Just be a better than the rest of them. So I think that's now why we see players come in like, you know, coming to the to the top end of the game a bit later on. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 perhaps that you, you need to you do you do you think your players need to go through that 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 long phase of where they're just sort of sitting around the middle. I mean, you, you could say that. I mean, is that fair of me to say that about you? Actually, is it fair of me to say that you've been sort of like sitting around the middle of the table and you're yeah. you're, you're 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 thinking to yourself, what do I have to do? What, what have I got to do? Do I know what I have to do? And, and if that's the case, tell us about that. What, what do you feel as if you need to do to claim, to claim the letter? I just think it's, a, it's about, you, it's timing, you know. Like, um, some players have come through and maybe not had the little defeats, the little box where, you, where you've, they've sat in that middle um, bit in the rankings for a long time. So I think, it's about timing. It's a little bit about luck. Uh, things go your way in certain matches. Obviously, you can break in 
into the top end of the game like really quickly these days with, with the way that it's structured. Uh, but for, for me at the minute, I, I think it's just about game mentally, like right going into matches. And I also think like if you've been on the tour a long time, certain tournaments don't really get you your kind of juices flowing as some others. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've kind of got to treat all the tournaments. I know Judd Trump recently said, didn't he, about he treats every tournament the same, whether he's trying to play down the World Championship coming up. But, you know, that's that's what he does, and that's why he wins. He does the name of the tournament, you know, he, he wins it. Mm-hmm. But, it, I mean, I, in terms of in terms of where you are, Presently, are you are you thinking about the the areas of your game where you perhaps need to think about how you're going to make that step up? Are you looking at your strengths and your weaknesses? Are you are you looking at your scoring, for example, in your matches? Are you actually watching your matches and thinking, like, this is what I need to do? Why am I not doing what I want to do? Why am I not winning my second and third matches? Why can't I get to another quarter final of a ranking event? Which you've done. You've got the quarter final. You've got the you know, last sixteens, and so you've proven you can beat good players. You've proven you can you can you can go a little bit further. So, what do you feel as if you need to do? What are the areas in your game you need to improve? Uh, I think it's quite hard to get all parts of your game work once, if you like. Kind of um, one match. Like I've I recently played Patrick and scored really heavily. Made two tons and another break and lost four for but because other parts of the game not working then so I think it's about it must be a mental bit that you know just to be ready um for matches and, and something I need to do which I've I've started to do in the last sort of three months is is to play with more players. Uh, used to get kind of you know hit like like lesser players I feel like if you hit two or three tons on on them sort of players, they crack. Whereas you need to be used to getting hit back with big breaks or losing, you know, tight frames and stuff. Playing long bouts of safety. So I, I think the match practice with with other good pros is is a way for me to go as well. Uh, I mean, I I've always encouraged amateur players, players that play in my competitions, to get away from their comfort zones. Um, you know, even though they don't have a competition, to go and play with their players. I mean, yeah. you've, now you've, just, you've just touched on that. I mean, how important is that? Um, massive, I think. I think like, I don't know, maybe in like a boxing terms, if you're, if you're not sparring the right, then if you're just sparring against, you know, the punch bag doesn't hit back, does it? So, you know, it's about, it's about practicing for tournaments and you need to play that level of, that level of opposition, like sort of day in day out, to get used to, you know, not not for forty minutes, uh, you know, all, all the different things that go on in Smith. You need to, you've just got to practice that, and it's got to be as close to like matches as it can be. Obviously, it never ever feels like that. kind of the closer you can get, I think the better. Mm-hmm. And do you and do you sort of analyze yourself in that respect? Do you sort of look at yourself and think, um, uh, you know, there's there's. I mean, I know I'm t- I've said this all right. I mean, obviously looking at areas of your game, where you, you, maybe you wish you'd score a bit heavier, you know. So what are what are your strengths? Do you think, uh, Liam, in terms of of your ability? What are your main strengths and what are your weaknesses? I think long parting has always always been my kind of. Uh, key to my game, and like, I think if the long balls start going in, the other guy is probably going to be in a bit of trouble. Um, but I kind of got one big punch, which is my long game and scoring. And if that's not, on, I think it's a it can kind of be a tough day for me against other players because I don't think I've got the best of patience, which doesn't happen. You're not playing well. Uh, so, yeah, so keys for me to like and long battle and just being comfortable playing that, that type of game. Um, yeah, the, the strengths I've always been, I've always put a lot of time into break building, I've always put a lot of time into into fighting because I think I always play too much for my own. Um, I 
and all you want to do is pop balls. So, mm -hmm. so to kind of counteract that now to get a bit more of a all round game, I think playing other pros is the way. I mean, playing safe on your own, I don't know. Like, you can't, it's not the same as it. Like, you know, you're not receiving the shot. Like, it's not like this sparring with someone in safety. So I think that's my practice together with other pros is, is the, the key to improving my match. Mm -hmm. And do you, do, do you, I mean, do you work on practice routines? Do you, uh, is there times when you look at some of your matches? I mean, for example, do you, do you take a look at yourself on YouTube and after yeah. the match or is it something you just put aside? Yeah, I'll always watch a little bit of my matches on YouTube. I try not to get as involved as I used to because I think you can think it and overanalyze it and uh, looking at past matches can also be the, the next match is not going to be like your past match so, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of get a bit too but if you can take like you know five five or ten matches and generalize them you'll, you'll find your weaknesses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said, a lot of players a lot of players do. The feedback I'm getting from a lot of the tour players is, Liam, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't want to reflect too much on the past because it, they maybe don't see it as moving forward as much as you know. You'll remember, you'll remember a, a missing the ball; it's cost you the frame. You'll remember the two or three mistakes you'll make in that frame. Yeah. Because you know there, there's not going to be that many in that respect. You know, so. I mean, is that something you think about yourself personally? I mean, if you if you if you're playing someone in a match and you miss a few balls or you miss a miss a few blacks off the spot or a few of those long balls, will you heavily reflect on that and then put the time in and another routine to try to try and fix that? I think I think if it's just like kind of easy balls, you're you're more than capable of getting kind of eyes shot that. That's just to let that affect kind of your next shot. I think you know is a bad thing. So I think the key is to just treat every shot as like a new shot and every shot the next mm -hmm. shot. Uh, but yeah, to work on I think to work on weaknesses, it's got to be more of a general thing. I think like is your cue ball control the general kind of safety? You know, individual pops a bit like you're more hot in them. So that, that's something mental to me. I don't think that. So obviously, uh, I mean, obviously, you're looking at the guys at the top. You're looking at the guys in the top sixteen. What are what are they doing that, that Liam Highfield is not doing? Uh, winning. Are they? <laughs> but, uh, are they just, are they just more consistent, or what do you need to do? These are the questions you will ask yourself. Yeah. Um, I think they don't let the past affect them as much as kind of people like me, but down the rankings do. That's the difference. Um, but I also think there's a there's a problem with snooker. Um, I, I find a big problem with snooker is does does some it's different to golf and to golf and tennis. Like financially, they've got enough money to prepare themselves. Absolutely perfectly, like with kind of nutrition, just all these different things. The problem I think with snooker is the lower end hasn't got the, the amount of money in for each individual to have a fair crack and you know, being the best that they can be. They can't pay you know, enough money for, for number eight, you know, different mm -hmm. like a or, or these kind of things. So I think. In Snoopy, it's a little bit unfair. And then, just expanding from that, you know, this is one of the things that I ask everybody, Liam. You know, the current the current tour format. What are your What are your views on the current tour format? Do you think it's fair? Do you think that it should be mixed up a little bit? What are you, What are your views? For me, it's good because I'm kind of in the top before, so that means that I play in big competition with someone below me. But if I was when I see um, young getting their tour card, I kind of think if we if we want a game where youngsters can improve, got a 
you know the old system where there was like the the sort of bottom thirty two played each other to play someone like a bracket up. Do you remember that? The old way that it was. Um, people's improvement. I think that would be a better structure. Mm-hmm. So it's it's hard because you know, and obviously that would mean that um, players lower down probably pick up a bit more money than the playing speed of their kind of level rather than you know top four player who nine times ten is going to beat them. Uh, so yeah, but also good enough. You're good enough. So mm-hmm. it's a tough one. I think you know if you. Everyone's had to come through it, but I think that's the re- that's also one of the reasons why snooker's not got too many like youngsters kind of coming through in the early twenties. Like did have sort of in the mid nineties, and we've we've seen that particularly in the last last season. Actually, and we've seen some very young kids coming out on the tour. Yeah. You know, 14, 15, 16, 17. and. You know, I don't really have a view on that. Do I think it's right and wrong? Do I, I, I don't think. I don't think I really think anything. I think they've got nothing to lose. I think that if they come on and play a couple of seasons and give a, a lot of really top quality opposition and experience, it's doing them no harm. Do you? Do you have that view? Uh, yeah. I also good enough. You're good enough, and one day you'll get there if you're good enough. Sort of things, but I do find it a little bit. I think the problem with the tour, is, you know, it is the financial bit down the bottom end. Mm-hmm. Person, I think, you know, someone who's giving their life to to a sort of profession uh, deserves to to be able to be themselves. You know? Like, so the, the the tour is really cut from. But I don't I don't know what the answer to it is. I think I quite like the, you know, the format for the World Championships where it's, mm-hmm. uh, is it like you're outside the 80 playing each other and then you play and then the top. Like, I think that's about right. And I think, I think, and I think players in the top or the top six do deserve that little bit of protection. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're up there for a reason and they should be, they should also be guaranteed a bit more money. So, I think I think slowly may switch may or more tournaments may go back to the old system I think but um, yeah that's the mixture would be good would be do you, do you feel maybe perhaps that those low, those lower ranked um, uh, um, uh, professionals should be playing other really uh, in those early stages uh, in, in in terms of uh, in, in that regard, do you think, a, or do you think there should be another process in which they guaranteed some money? Uh, well, uh, I think they should be playing each other and improving, improving playing mm. each other. Uh, yeah, because what what is the point? Sixteen years, getting on the tour at the minute and going through a whole season. Uh, Playing a top eight player nearly every comp, like, mm-hmm. they kind of, uh, to come out with zero pounds, and he's done a lot of money on travel and food and whatever. I just don't see, and he's got all you. I just don't see the point in it. I just think, mm-hmm. I just think he played someone, and he got he got more table time. You know, more chance to practice. He beats that. He beats. Them. Then he plays someone a step up. I think there's a. You can see where you're at. I don't think anybody. Who just get back, sees sees where they're getting. And then in, in, I mean, in relations to comparing when you came on the tour, to watching the current guys coming on there, you know, the young guys. You know the Jamie Wilsons and the young French kid, and, you know, coming on, or going right, right in at the deep end. Is it? Is it? Do you do you feel it's a lot tougher for them uh, now than it was for you when you came on? Yeah, we, I, on when it's a bit more staggered. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it depends on their draws as well. There's a big difference 
So, I mean, they can play a top 64 player, so there's a big difference between drawing, like, uh, number two or three and drawing number 63. Of course. And if you keep getting them draws where you're, like, drawing a top eight player every comp, then, you know, that's, that's just... You might get a bit more... Depends where you... Some people, I don't know, some people may turn pro these days and kind of be happy to lose and be on a TV table playing a top player. Mm-hmm. Well, I would be, you know what I mean? That depends what sort of person you are, I think, whether you're someone who win or someone who just wants to be seen, I think. You know? The players, it's fair to say that the standard of the game's improving all the time. I mean, yeah. if you if you look at the standard back in my day, you know, when players in my day were coming through in the eighties and the nineties, and you you know you look at that top thirty two back then, where you had Thorborn and Higgins and Mountjoy and Davis, and then yeah. you look at uh, you look at the standard now, you know, yeah. thirty four years later, it's much much higher. But is is this is this something that the players like yourself are conscious of every season? Now you're thirty years of age, you've been on the tour ten years. Is is the standard getting better every year? It definitely, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm a I'm a miles better player than I was uh, ten years ago when I was twenty. But I'm probably only fifteen places higher in the rankings. But it's but it's mm. not because I've been unlucky or anything. It's because everybody else has got better as well. Uh, and I think I think snooker players around me in the rankings and. And on themselves are very harsh, mm-hmm. but I also think uh, I also think people's opinions on players around me in the room is also very harsh. I think mm-hmm. commentators type of thing that don't understand how how much better we are than kind of yesteryear, if you like. Uh, when you look at the number of centuries that pros around, you know, this day and age. And making compared to mid nineties, you know, it's just they was like, like there was. I recently looked up. There was someone who got to number three in the world in like nineteen ninety something, and I think he'd made it. I think he'd made seventy centuries in his whole career. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, like, number seventy centuries now doesn't probably get you in the top top mm-hmm. fifty. Do you know what I mean? That's right. So there's a vast there's a vast difference, and and I and I think we get kind of labelled as as nowhere near as good as uh, somebody was maybe in the top twenty like twenty years ago, when the reality is we're probably much better than we were. But they were good. At, they were good. At like COVID, COVID's been a bit of a tester for everybody. Okay, because a lot of you lads have been cooked up in Milton Keynes, you know, so very, very strange times. So let's talk about that for a wee bit. Um, how, 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 how has that affected you personally? You know, COVID obviously and um, practicing and being cooped up in Mil- Milton Keynes. Yeah, I think uh, it's got to say thank you to sort of Milton Keynes thing because without them, I don't know. There's nowhere better, for, you know, to be sort of in a venue in the bubble that it is. You know, the hotel venue mm-hmm. work, work situation. Uh, I think for me is like kind of not having people, not so much not having people there to watch in my because majority of my matches I haven't got anyway. Um, but you know, when you just take like a couple of friends or you know my mum comes with me all mm-hmm. uh, so I think the relaxation away from the industry has been quite a thing for me uh, we've taken me to kind of just take my mind off mm-hmm. um, that's the biggest biggest change for me the rest of it I'm not really too fussy where I mm-hmm. quite like an hour down the road to my Keynes to be honest uh, I don't I don't miss. Uh, I, don't, I don't miss all the traveling that goes with snooker. Mm-hmm. But when it when it does come, out, I think uh, maybe it's made a few of the lads. Mm-hmm. 
travel the world because we do. How important is the support at the venues, though? I mean, how important is that to you? I mean, is that something that obviously you just talked talk about it there in terms of you? Obviously, you can't interact with the guys in the players' lounge and what have you. You can't do as very, very little you can do. But isn't support like a, a big, big thing, big part of what you're what you're doing? It is for me, yeah. Uh, I kind of like, I kind of have to, I, I think I play my when I feel at home, wherever. So, um, yeah, I always need kind of people that, people close to me with me. Mm-hmm. Good food and, you know, being able to go to food. Is a, just gen- general things to take your mind off snooker. I think, to, you know, win a match and then, you, and then you've got your next match tomorrow. I think in the minute you kind of go back to your hotel room and you've got nothing but sports at the minute. So, I mean, it's quite a strange place to be, to be sitting in a hotel room with thoughts of how good or bad or you know that, that you think you're going to play so when there's people there it distracts you from that and how do you distract yourself off the table what kind of things do you get up to in the hotel do you listen to a bit of music watch a movie read a book how do you how do you distract yourself in that, in that respect COVID thing Watch a bit of Netflix. <laughs> uh, during, during the COVID thing, I've just, um, yeah, I've always got music on all the time, constantly got music on. Uh, but yeah, I've been reading uh, Fury's book, uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes get out for a run. I've always been into running. So yeah, just trying to stay busy. But you've got to be in a good place to stay busy, I think. So. I do, I do sort of sympathise with some of the lads who, uh, you know, are finding it tough. There's been kind of a few players out there with um, speaking out about mental health, which is good because it enables people to talk uh, about mental health. It's important in sport. That's everything. Absolutely everything. And it's, I think, you know, in a snigger. I mean, a lot of people have different views on it. Some people don't even think it's a sport, Liam, you know. Uh, I mean, our governing body don't even think it's a sport. How about that one? You know, so, I mean, it's it's a bit strange, really, you know, that, that gyms and sports clubs can open up, and but snooker clubs can't on April 12th. Yeah. I can't get my head around that one, but I think just going back to the mental side of things, it's very, very important. You know, for clubs that offer gaming areas, whether it's boxing, gymnasium, yeah. it's very, very important to encourage kids to, to get back into sports and leisure clubs, you know, and uh, in, in that respect, the mental side of the snooker game is a massive, massive part of it because so many things can go wrong. You know, things like bad luck, for example, uh, I suppose that affects a lot of players, you know. Well, a little bit of bad luck can cost you a frame. Yeah. What's your view on that one? On the what well, the on the mental on the mental side. Everything. Bad luck. Snooker is one of the I mean look. Uh, so you've got golf be- a lot of bad luck. You know, in got- tennis there's not a lot of bad luck. In snooker there can be a lot of bad luck, so it affects you mentally very, very stressfully. Yeah, you know? yeah. I can sometimes feel like bad luck, right? but um, I, I think you've got to be completely mad to be a snooker player. Honestly, I think I think to grow up and play something so mm-hmm. solitary and so something you've got to put so many hours in and be so obsessed with, mm-hmm. I think you've got to be meant to part with. Do you know what I mean? I think it's a crazy game. Um, so I think you've got to be an obsessive person to be any good at it anyway. Uh, and obsessiveness isn't good for anyone's mental health, but unfortunately, I think snooker players are kind of born with it. Um, As you said earlier, it's the way the players, it's how the individual deals with it. Yeah. So, you know, coming to terms with anxiety, uh, yeah. stress, bad luck when you're at the venue it is a massive, massive part of it. And I see that in the young guys who are getting on the tour and uh, it's very much the difference between them winning and losing. 
yeah um yeah every, uh, and i think the higher higher up you go you know in the rankings i think uh what separates people is the mental side uh, I think that is the separation between the top eight and, and being 40, 58. I don't think they're, they're loads better on a snooker table. I think they're, they're able to uh, wipe bad experiences much quicker, and much better, and not let it affect anything in the future. So, yeah, it's something that players need to... Uh, I think more should go down the route of... Uh, kind of sports psychology and mm-hmm. sort of like that uh, one for the mental health and two for two for the game just getting slightly going off track a little bit here um some of the guys are suggesting that i ask a lot of the professionals about the conditions and the venues you go to um we've seen this very recently at some of the major events where professionals have made comments about the cloth, the speed of the cloth, and the conditions. I mean, what what what's that all about? Is it why are the tables and why is the cloth running differently? Uh, the only the only um, kind of discrepancy I have with conditions is the TV table plays so much different than the outside tables. Uh, I think you get people speaking out about it more now. Um, and the same players, and rightly so, they need to be on TV because they're the best players in the world, uh, play on the same table match after match. And you come off a back table, which is kind of four balls slower. And you've got to pick it up when they've done it for like three matches before. Um, I think it's equivalent to me going and playing on your own table. There's a massive advantage there. Uh, but yeah, I think generally conditions are quite good. I don't know. I don't know. I always find them they're pretty good. They're not, but they're pretty consistent. I don't. I don't get wrapped up in conditions. I just think if you're queuing well and you're playing well, you can, you can kind of play on anything. I think you're on the same table. You're playing off the same level. You have to adapt to the conditions. I suppose it's a bit like playing a pro arm on a. Uh, at a club with club tables and the, the, the cloth is very slow you both have to adapt to it very quickly yeah and it was it will it's the, the, the conditions when people say it's the same for both players it's not always true you, you can get players that are better on slow tables uh, and players that are better on quicker tables but generally the conditions on tour are, they're pretty good you know they're, they're always pretty fast they're always Fairly reactive. The only the only problem I have is like uh, playing three matches in the back room and then going to play on a TV table, which is seems twice as lively and twice as quick. Mm-hmm. Playing against the players on that. I'm going to touch on uh, going very well here. Then I'm going to touch on amateur snooker. Just for a wee moment, it's always great to get a professional's view on, on anything that he can suggest, you know, for for a lot of the amateurs who are coming through. Now, there's a, there's a lot of guys who are going to go to Q2 this year. Yeah. They're obviously going to go and do their damnest to get on the tour. What, what would you say to those, those lads, Liam, in, in your experience, how, in, in terms of preparing themselves and the kind of things that they should be thinking about? Uh, before they decide to enter a Q school with, you know, obviously aspirations of getting on the tour and making a living, what, what, what kind of things would you say to them? Uh, just to get stuck in the thing. I mean, this is this is what big days with I mean, is they're all, they want to play on like a a, a star table like like every day on in every tournament and every pro am it's like. They feel sick if someone puts them on the club table. I just think as an amateur, just get get right in the thick of it. I play playing as much as you can. every tournament. Just get in, like just just because the table's not. I mean, when we come through, we was I don't think I played I was like, like B, uh, mm-hmm. um, sixteen almost 
when I turned pro. So we just played on. We don't play. We played on crap, really. Uh, but it seems like that's shifted to amateurs wanting like every 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 little comp they play in, which I think it's about the competition more when you're an amateur. It's not about the table. Tell you what, man, it's very, very good to hear that view from you there because I am totally with you on that one. I think maybe perhaps some of the amateur players are a little bit spoiled with maybe if they're playing on a good table and they're expecting too much. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, but for people coming from Q school, obviously, mm -hmm. yeah, just a or just just competing. And yeah, look mm -hmm. look at the map. I just think Q school, if you're like good enough, you'll you'll come through it. Um, it's a good standard, but it's not a, it's not like an amazing standard. You're gonna get chances. all the matches will have plenty of chances in them. Um, so yeah, it's probably one in the preparation. Also, the the players coming off the tour, I think, have got a massive advantage. Uh, they've been playing on the tour, especially this time, because amateur snooker has not been not been on for the best part of what a year now. So, uh, mm -hmm. players who've been playing on the tour who drop off, I'll be very surprised if a lot of them. Don't. I'm going to throw a question at you here, Liam. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Okay. Um, if you had to go to Q school, <laughs> how much of a struggle do you think it would be for you? No. Right. Uh, I say you have to go to Q school. Yeah. In, in May. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't. Being honest, I don't think I struggle like at all. Um, I think there is levels to snooker, and mm -hmm. it, to be honest, I think any. If you stuck any player inside the sort of top top fifty or sixty, I think if you put them in Q school, if they happen to be there, I think they'll come. Uh, occasionally, you get one. Obviously, Michael White. I expected him to just just breeze for a Q school. To be honest, so did equally, I. Equally, if you if you lose your confidence, you know, in snooker, kind of things go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. That must be what happened to Michael, but I think. Yeah, that's kind of one person who I, who I thought would just breeze mm. through, and I think he will this year. He's, he's played in quite a lot of the pro tournaments. Um, he, he's, he seems like he's got a bit of dedication back. So mm -hmm. when he gets back on the tour, it's like, looks stupid having I mean, amateur written next to his name. Absolutely. I mean, Michael, Michael's a, an example of the kind of player who would fall off, who's fallen off very quickly at the level he's got because he's a, he's a very aggressive player, very, you know, very, oops, a very quick player, very talented player. But, yeah. you know, obviously the, the, the results weren't coming through I mean, I mean, I mean, he dropped off to that extent. Yeah. And uh, do it. Just a bad spell in it and obviously lost mm -hmm. confidence. Um, but yeah, someone with bottle as well. Michael's won the one tournament. And he, I he think... Looked I think I think for Michael it is confidence psychological. You know he's obviously a very talented lad, I'm very fond of him actually. You know, uh, uh, I think in that regard, I think he's young enough and he's good enough to to get back on the tour and certainly good enough to get back in the top thirty-two. You know, or we we were just talking a second ago there, Michael, about standards, and my view is there's massive massive difference in standard between those top thirty-two players. Yeah. Do you share that view? Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely go to 40. I think, um, yeah, you, you get limited chances against the sort of opposition. Uh, but I, th I also think there's a big difference between like the top 80 to, to below that. Mm. I think there's groups in snooker, like, like top 32, top 40. At, great and like, they're all great players but I also feel like players outside the top 80 and I don't think uh, I think there's a gap there as well Right we're going sort of running out of a wee bit of time here I want to talk about your equipment okay yep. 
Let's talk about your cue and your tip and what have you. Let's talk about what sort of cue you play with, what sort of tips and chalk you use. I'm a, I'm just like old school, I think. I'm, I, I play with a John Paris cue that I've had a, quite a good few years now, but I've played with Paris cue since I was 13, 14. Um, mm. I just I just play with the old triangle. Obviously, most of the players hate it. Though um, it's like chalk wars going on because you get a kick and they blame it on. You. But uh, yeah, I play with just the old triangle stuff, and it's been good enough for what? How long? So it's been good enough for, for that long. Then I just can see it. Any. it. Quite like the I tried the the blue parax tom chalk there. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was quite impressed with that. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, that's I, meant to. I think it's I've tried the talon, so, but I, I find it slips off the white a bit. I think it's it's you've just hit it on the head earlier there, Michael. You know, I mean, uh, you know, players will players will play with different shocks, and they'll just either adapt to it very quickly or they won't. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a bit like tips on the queue. I mean, what what are you what are you playing with? Just a outmaster, just hard, uh, hard, 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 uh, just as hard as I can get one in the box. Probably get like five or ten in a box of fifty. But I've tried other ones; they split and all sorts goes on. I just think it's like it's probably a bit mental. I think I've I've used it for I've used that that equipment for like twenty years. It's kind of hard to get away now i think it's just just some embedded kind of belief in it that i don't think it's going to make me too much better playing play a different tip so yeah just stick to the old stuff so what's ahead for you then kid obviously you've got the the world qualifiers mm -hmm. pending yeah um are you looking forward to that what sort of things are you thinking at the moment uh, yeah. uh, as to where you are on the tour and what you want to do, I get really excited when the when the worlds was a few weeks ago, like a few weeks ago. Yeah, just just as much dedication. Go and uh, try and work on my kind of mental skills and my game on my own a little bit. Um, obviously, I pl played at the Crucible in two two thousand and eighteen, so and it was my favorite. My favorite. Uh, so there's kind of I've tasted it, but you, you you want it, you want it, you want to get there so much that sometimes it can affect your game. But that's the that's the whole point of trying to improve mentality. It's and you would say that that's the part of your game you'd like to improve, you'd like to work on the mental side, the the confidence side of your game. Is that is that a big big thing for you at the moment? Yeah. I think so. Um, it's definitely it's getting better. Um, my temperament much better than it used to be, but I think that's the that's the only area left to kind of perfect, if you like. I, I quite mm -hmm. like the that I play snooker quite aggressive and go for shots. Um, so I'm happy with my game. It's just you know, I want to be want to be feeling good all the time, thinking good things. And in terms of practicing, are you are you a heavy a heavy heavy practicer, or do you have a, what sort of time frames do you put on the practice table? Uh, if I'm if I'm playing uh, with other pros, it's sort of like like six seven hours. Um, if I'm mm. on my own, I'm trying to trying to do like quality rather than quantity. So it's just like, like a couple of about two or three hours on my own, or, or all day with people. Up. Um, so yeah, just work on specific things. No. No wasted time practicing, um, you know, just hitting balls and kind of, I think that's something you do when you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. And do you have a, do you have a table at home or do you, do you prefer to mix it, go to a club or mix and match or what? Yeah, but, uh, I go to the, go to the club at the minute. I'm playing a little bit uh, at my, my mate's house. Just got a table because the, it's, you know, it's, just a table in the building and a room. So I played a little bit there, a little bit at the club, like where I've played for the last five years at the Reading, uh, uh, close to home. And and travelling with people, uh, travelling to people sort of two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. 
again, getting away from perhaps maybe your home, your comfort zone. I think a lot of players in that respect were sort of kind of thinking maybe the future is to have a have their own table at a club and, yeah. and have the distractions around them. You know, yeah. I think Karen Wilson takes that option where he, he prefers his table in the club, Northampton yeah. Club. And he, he wants, perhaps maybe he's like a, he, he has the window. He chose to have the window. Yeah, good you know, stuff. Where, and uh, do you think that helps? Yeah, depends on the person, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Some people like to go out to work, don't they? Feel like they're getting out of the house to go to work. Me, I had a house and it was uh, capable of having a snooker table. I would I would have it because, like, I just play snooker, do you know what I mean? It's not, it wouldn't be like, I wouldn't get lazy with it. I just, I'd do a certain amount of hours and, and still treat it as a job. Uh, and still go and play people, so I, so I would still get that kind of getting out as well. Very good, right, buddy? We're going to wrap this up in a wee second. I'm going to ask you one final question, okay? I want you to think about this very, very carefully. I'm putting yeah. you on the spot. All right, where are you going to be this time next year? This time next year, uh, ranking event winner in the 82 would be nice. Very nice. So, is that one of your goals for possibly next season? If you can nick a ranking event, you'll put yourself, yeah. put yourself perhaps in that top thirty-two. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, definitely. And sort of gotten it. Looks like I'm maybe getting the top forty-eight this year. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, just keep. Ultimately, just the, the big goal is to win a ranking event at some point in my career. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Liam, thanks for doing the life on the tour spot for me, mate. We'll have a nice wee chat and um, I'll just say goodbye. Guys, thanks very much for joining us for this. This will be on YouTube. Obviously, take, most of you tend to take a look at these things a little bit later. Next week, we've got uh, Q Tour on the tour discussion. We're going to have a chat. We're going to have Chris Henry, we're going to have Jason Ferguson, Barry Pinches. We're going to talk about the kind of things that the players are thinking before they go to Q school and everything else that they're thinking about, about living on the tour. So join us next week for that one.